Okay, yes. TV Photo X 1.5 TFX, and welcome back to another video. Well, guess three times what this episode is gonna be about, but uh, yeah, we are gonna do the intro no matter what, so here we go. The Book Club's Flavor of the Week reading review, my attempt at an underwater video selfie, a hole that changes size depending on how you twiddle some knobs. The absolute worst example of images I've ever presented, a smorgasbord of assorted accessories, and I'm still sitting in a chair. And welcome back. Yes, this episode is going to be a little bit about the Nikonos 5 underwater camera system, a system that I've actually in all fairness, talked about it a little bit before, but in any case, I have a little bit of a cheat sheet here, some of the points I want to go through, but just a little bit of a caution here in the beginning. Yes, I have used this camera actually as intended, uh, yeah, and so on, and all what that means, but uh, that also means that because of my lack of experience with this system, these are basically some of the most uh, Neutrociously bad example images I have ever presented in a episode like this but alas the experience of getting those uh, uh, images were anything less than fantastic so I think that that is a little bit of a win-win situation or rather it cancels each other out anyway <clears throat> The Nikonos 5 system was introduced in 1984 and was uh, carried on until 2001. It is waterproof down to 50 meters, which is uh, quite a bit deeper than where most recreational divers are daring to go. Uh, normally, your uh, beginning diving career for your advanced or rather your open water certification is a little bit different depending on which uh, organization you took your certificate with. Uh, some, for some it's uh, 18 meters and some it's 21 meters and so on. It's, it's a little bit different depending on who you took your certification with. But anyway, well, a little bit that I, uh, yeah, you know, this is a zone focused camera. What does that imply? Well, it is not a TLR and it's not a rangefinder and it's not a SLR camera zone focus basically means that the top part here you actually just look through to do a rough composition and then this is the uh, the lens that would actually take the image and what you do have then is a distance scale and a aperture scale so uh, yeah you actually have to guesstimate the distance to your subject uh, and that can be a little bit of a um, hassle one thing is that you can probably have the the um, <clears throat> Well, actually, when you look at one of the videos I have over here, basic underwater photography with the Nikonos 5, uh, it basically, they teach you to hold the camera, set it to, I think, three feet uh, as a focus distance, three feet away. And uh, if you have a, a uh, strobe unit like this, an SB105, you can put it to basically uh, F8, F11. Once you're ready to dive, go through your check routine one more time. You don't want the excitement of getting ready for a dive to prevent you from preparing your camera equipment thoroughly, nor do you want the excitement about the beautiful shots you're about to take to distract you while preparing for a safe dive. Double check your camera mode selector to make sure it's in the A or aperture priority position. Your ASA ISO setting is set for the film speed you are using. Your focus distance is set for three feet the f-stop at f11, and you strobe to the TTL or through the lens position. Susan, let me give you one more tip. Yeah? Right now you've got the strobe mounted on the inside of the arm. A lot of photographers prefer to have it mounted on the outside of the arm. Why is that? Well, it reduce the, reduces the problem we have with backscatter. Backscatter is caused by the suspended particles in between the camera lens and the subject. If we have the strobe mounted too close, to the camera lens, it'll pick up on all of those suspended particles and it'll cause a problem that we call backscatter. I see, okay. By moving the strobe further away from the camera lens, we get less of that problem. The light will still 
come forward and hit the suspended particles, but it will bounce back in a different direction and the lens won't pick it up. Right. We also have to think a little bit about the aiming of the strobe. As if we hold it away from ourselves like this, mm -hmm. so that we can look both into the lens and into the strobe simply by changing the position of our eyes, we know that the strobe now is aimed roughly at where we want it to be. Right. Underwater, we'll check that again, though. OK, thanks. So the only thing you need to do is to compo uh, just check your image while just extending your arm because that's approximately three feet away if you're normally built. So that means that you have your arm as a distance metering device and uh, then you just compose and take your image. So that's a little bit of a workaround on how to use this uh, camera underwater to get an approximation of the zone focusing system. <clears throat> but alas, you, you know, th this camera also, when it uh, was introduced, it uh, was the first underwater film camera, to my knowledge, that had both aperture priority and a full TTL flash exposure control. So yeah, that's also an in the viewfinder. You have the shutter speed readout and it will show if you're under or overexposed if you have it on anything else, if you have it on one of the manual shutter speed settings. And the manual shutter speeds, uh, they go from one, th one thousandth of a second, one five hundred, one, one, one two fiftieth, uh, one two fifth, one hundred and twenty fifth of a second, Manual 90, the only shutter speed on this that is pure me mechanical is M90, 1 60th, 1 30th, and of course bulb mode, bulb mode or brief time, uh, depending on how you want to put it. Anyway. I have to put it out there, yeah, I have all this plethora here of accessories for the Nikonos system, uh, but uh, for this uh, purposes, I actually only have, uh, I actually only use it in this configuration as I have here uh, with the 35 millimeter lens. And the 35 millimeter is basically a kit lens uh, that is uh, 35 millimeter and f2.5. Uh, it is a six element design in four groups, and the closest focus distance is. Uh, 0.8 meters. Is that right? Let's just see here. That sounds a little bit... Yeah, 0.8 meters. So a little bit of a meter, three feet. Yeah, you get the gist of it. <clears throat> Batteries, it uh, takes uh, two S76, A76 or LR44s. Or it can take a lithium uh, CR1-3N. So yeah, that's a little bit of it, uh, the short gist of it. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's uh, go over here, shall we? Well, before we continue on here, uh, the I actually put three rolls of film through this uh, camera. And uh, the rolls were basically first uh, Fuji Color C200. <clears throat> What else did I put through it? Well, this is probably a modern classic, or whatever you want to call it. The Kodak Color Plus. Both of these are 200 ISO uh, films, so a little bit of a general purpose. And finally, because there is a little bit of a caveat, you know, if you are a scuba diver out there, you know that, uh, first of all, for when you descend down, uh, every color will start to get less and less because sunlight won't penetrate, so Red, unfortunately, is one of the colors that disappear first, and then yellow, so on and so forth, and in the end, you basically have blue before going to complete darkness. So another little thing with this camera is, if you want colorful shots and you don't have a speed light, you basically have to stay fairly shallow. But anyway, I thought that as a compromise in order to be able to get fairly decent exposures, even when we went a little bit deeper, uh, I would try this one, Kodak Ultramax 400. And uh, yeah, what would I say is my experience then with these films and which one would I prefer to continue using? Well, one that I really enjoy using is the Fujifilm 
uh, Fuji Color C200. But as we all know, uh, with Fujifilm's track record of discontinuing all of their film stocks and so on, uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, I don't really see the value. For me, I'm a little bit cautious about uh, Fujifilm because I don't know how long they will keep their films in production. But as long as this is uh, available, I actually enjoyed this uh, for underwater photography. But if I'm going to put one that I would use uh, that is readily available, that I think actually yields very good results, are easy to scan, and uh, the files are very good to use in Lightroom all the way through from photo to finished product. Uh, the Color Plus 200 ISO, this is my go-to general purpose film. It works for most the most parts. If I would have any, you know, special thing that I want to do, for me uh, personally, I am a big fan of Kodak Ektar. I love the saturated colors of this film, but this is the general purpose equivalent that don't break the bank. You can get it in a 10 pack and it is really good from my experiences. So Color Plus, my favorite of the bunch. And that leads to us to the one that I the least enjoy. I, I, I know that there is a following for Ultramax 400 ISO film. Yes, I know this has a niche, it has a purpose, but for me personally, I don't really like the look of this film. It's for every time I have used it, uh, when I scanned the results, I always get a green cast to the film that I'm personally not a fan of. But to each their own, there are people who really enjoy this, uh, just I'm not a fan. I rather prefer Color Plus. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, go on with it, shall we? Uh, we have then a little bit of the accessories that we can have with this camera system. Well, I have a plethora here of some extra lenses. Here you have the 35mm, then there is the 20mm f2.8 wide angle. This one doesn't have the type of interface on the front here with distance and f-stops. Uh, instead, you have two dots here on the controls, and uh, when you manipulate them, you get an estimate of where your focus will go. So that's a little bit interesting how they managed to solve that problem. So this is a bit of a more of a wide angle. And then you have the telefocus lens of the bunch, the or tele, the 80mm f4. So yeah, 80 millimeter lens, and it's a little bit less light sensitive than the other two. There is also a fabled 15 millimeter. If you go to look, check out the video from Alec Pierce, is at Alec Pierce Scuba. He has a great video when he talks about the 15 millimeter wide angle. But there is a little bit of a workaround in that one as well. And CNC, which has also done a lot of third party. Uh, yeah, parts for the Nakano system as well as the, uh, as for their own. Here's one piece of kit that is actually a little bit interesting and I might uh, use uh, myself in the future when the situation arises. It's a wide angle converter that you just screw into the filter threads of the 35 millimeter uh, kit lens. So that's a little bit of a neat workaround. The only difference is that when you use this you basically have to put it on infinity focus which limits you. You have a little bit of a more limitation on how to use the system. Um, either than that you have all of these three. I have three different versions here. Uh, there are macro extension tubes. Uh, so these are also made for the 35 millimeter a millimeter lens like so. So you basically take off the 35 millimeter, you put this onto the camera and you put the 35 millimeter here. Only downside with this is that you basically limit yourself to one type of photography uh, when you do under, when you use the camera. Then a different little accessory that would I would recommend personally more than the macro extension tubes would probably be the close-up system. <clears throat> Here you have it. 
This now is configured for the 35mm once again. You also have for the 80mm and I believe the, what is this, the 28mm. Uh, so there are a couple of different brackets that you change depending on which lens you use on the camera. But basically what you do, you put this aluminum tube on aluminum tube on the accessory mount of the camera and then you just basically put this on top in front of the lens and you attach it with some grub screws. Uh, what this is a little bit cumbersome, it may, it's a little bit unwieldy, maybe not so much on the water, but the benefit of this system compared to the macro extension tubes are that the, this can be removed under water and you can use the attached lens as uh, originally intended. So it's a good little, a good little middle way. It's not a true macro system, but it will get you in the ballpark that you can, you know, choose to do close-up photography or regular type photography. Well, then you have the. Uh, SB105 flash unit. It has a guide number of 22. It has a angle of uh, coverage of 103 degrees by 84 degrees. It takes four AA batteries and it has both TTL and uh, manual settings for full power, uh, quarter power and 1 16th power. And also yeah, uh, if you put it on test and 1 16th power, you can actually use this as a emergency strobe. If you're doing a night dive and you need to call attention on the surface, you might have a surface marker buoy and you can use this as a, as a uh, signaling device. So that's a little bit of a neat feature for this strobe unit. But I think that's all in all for me for now when it comes to uh, the system itself. Well, what is my uh, verdict for it then? Okay, now we're back here with my overview of my thoughts about the Nikon S5 underwater camera. Well, we're beginning with ease of use. Well, for ease of use, this is a bit of a double-edged sword actually, because as a land camera, this would be actually fairly decent for doing landscapes and so on with its zone focusing system, which in itself is a bit tricky to use because you don't see through the lens that is actually taking the image, but a approximation in the viewfinder. But if you want to use this camera as intended by Nikon when it was manufactured, it is a purebred, or, uh, well, amphibious uh, camera. Which means that this is, as stated probably before, it is waterproof down to 50 meters, which is a lot deeper than what most recreational scuba divers are certified to go. But with that being said, that shows us also that this camera is intended for underwater use and if you want to use it underwater in it, the capacity it is meant to, you really need to show proof that you are a certified scuba diver and has gone through the requisite training in order to do this sport safely. So in that aspect, because it has, you need to have proper training in order to use it to its fullest potential. Coupled to that, this camera is, if used underwater, fairly maintenance heavy, with that you have O-rings that, if not cared for properly, can lead to a flooding of the camera, which means that you need to put it in for repairs. And in today's market, when film photography is not really the norm, that might be a little bit tricky to get. Uh, proper maintenance for the camera. That's why it gets a bad ease of use, because of what is needed for the proper use. Fast glass. Well, I get the, give this a good rating based upon that uh, when you look at the uh, 
native lens lineup by Nikkor for the Nikonos system that all uses the same, pretty much the same proprietary bayonet fitting. Uh, you have a fastest glass uh, range from f2.5 to f4, depending on the focal range of the uh, lens uh, used. But uh, that will also mean that uh, for every focus distance, focal range that you're used, you have to take into the account that underwater everything, because of the, the properties of water, uh, everything seems to be about 25% bigger than what it actually is. A little bit of a optical illusion that you have to take into account. But uh, when uh, talking about zone focusing, which is how this camera operates, uh, there might be a little bit of a point uh, out to say that a deeper depth of field might be desirable. But uh, as we all know through reciprocity and the exposure triangle, that will lead to uh, in the fact that you need to use either more light or artificial light in the form of a underwater flash strobe unit or speed light in this uh, instance. For me it was the Nikonos SP105 speed light. So you have to take that into consideration and that uh, artificial light underwater don't travel great distances generally speaking. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag in this one, but overall, for all intents and purposes, if you stay fairly shallow or if you use artificial lights, the f-stops and the fast glass in this range are fairly decent, so I can give it a good rating. Versatility, another tricky one to answer in a significant way, because in order to get the best out of this camera system, you really need to search out literature and or other means, from maybe advice tutorial or instructional videos here on YouTube for instance, or the extremely good VHS series uh, with the Martin Sutton a film that Grand Cayman, Cayman Islands, uh, in order to show how to get the best out of the Nikonos 5 system and its uh, assorted accessories. So in uh, order then to get the best out of the Nikonos 5 system and all its accessories, I really then recommend you to seek out some additional literature information about uh, underwater photography, because it is a bit of an art form in itself. Uh, first of all, if you are a PADI certified scuba diver, one of the good things is that if you have the uh, adventure in Adventures in Diving Manual, which is uh, basically the manual for everything past your open water diver certification, uh, there are a little bit of an introductory like a chapter at least for underwater photography and underwater videography. So that's a book that could be a bit of a beginner's guide to basic underwater photography. Uh, then we also have a book that I have shown before, How to Use CNC, which is a little bit of a brochure uh, coupled with uh, what CNC has used uh, and made for the Nikonos system. So yeah, it's a used book, but uh, looking on uh, things like Amazon and so on, who had its start in used book sales, uh, I would say that that might be a good place to start. Another good example is uh, The Beginner's Guide to Underwater Photography by Howard R. Roberts. A book that I think I've shown before that I got used actually, I think it was on Amazon actually, and it is a, a miniature course in basic uh, photography concepts for underwater use. So there is a little bit of the Nikonos system, previous generations, but nonetheless a little bit of a beginner's guide to the photographing underwater. Another one that uh, is uh, worth a read, in my opinion, is Jim Church's Essential Guide to Composition, a simplified approach to taking better underwater pictures. And this was a thrift book as well that uh, yeah, goes through the different generations of the Nikonos system and a little bit of how to do a little bit more creative underwater photography and composition and so on. And for, your, for the Swedish crowd out there, uh, we have Tony Holm, Foto under Vatten, 
technique of pratique, which uh, roughly translated into English would become Photo Underwater, Technique and Practice by Tony Hall, which goes through equipment, lighting, home builds, optics, etc. So, yeah, and of course, not to forget the VHS series from Ed Sutton and uh, the team at Fisheye Grand Cayman, who has done a brilliant three-part series about underwater photography from the basics to the advanced, when they go into macro photography, close-up photography, and even wide-angle photography. So, if you have the ability to get one of those uh, VHS copies and maybe burn them to a DVD or a USB, that would be really recommended in order to get the most out of the, this system. And that's why ease of use, or rather versatility, I have given this a good rating. Because it's a little bit of studying in order to get the best out of this system. Optics. Well, you know what you expect from Nikkor lenses, and uh, these ones, when you get it into focus, they don't disappoint whatsoever. Case in point here also, to have a little bit of a caveat, from my per uh, personal experience thus far with the Nikonos 5 system, I have only used the kit lens, the 35mm f2.5, which underwater, since everything is 25% uh, bigger, becomes a little bit more like a 50mm, approximately. But uh, nonetheless, when you nail focus with this, which is a little bit of an art form in itself, since, as stated, this is a zone focus camera, there might be a little bit of difficulty to judge the, uh, the distance. But when it, you nail focus on this one and you have a, a good lighting situation, which is a little bit of the, you know, why it is a little bit more difficult to use this camera, you can really get some really brilliant results and to have the yeah bragging rights that these are not just underwater scuba diving images but they are film underwater scuba diving images so yeah all in all for the optics for the kit lens at least uh, i am really pleased with the images taken when focus was nailed so uh, all in all with my these are basically the worst example images i've ever taken but that has to be said that it is because it's a brand new experience at least for me i'm more into digital underwater photography because then you can also film in most cases but all in all this is a wonderful setup and a wonderful piece of kit when it comes to the lenses so yeah it's practice makes perfect so yeah that's why they get a bad rating because of the additional uh, zone focusing and the steep learning curve that occurs but that doesn't uh, say anything that the optics are bad per se but you really need to know what you're doing and all of the factors has to align perfectly in order to nail that shot compared to what most of us are used to nowadays with autofocus and all of these half automatic modes even though the Nikonos 5 is an aperture priority camera or a camera uh, there is a lot of things that has to line up in order to get a perfect good image so for that reason optically it gets a bad rating not because the lenses themselves are bad per se but because it's hard to use. Durability. Well, I have to admit here actually that this is one of the few cameras that I had to buy twice. Why was that? Because the first one seemed to have had its electrics fried, or at least it didn't work on any other version than on the manual 60, but uh, yeah, M60. But uh, that, I think, has a lot to do about how the camera has been maintained over the years. Keep in, po keep in mind that this camera was introduced in 1984 and production was ceased in 2001. Uh, and that goes to show that there might be a lot of copies of this camera out there that haven't been cared for, haven't been uh, greased with silicon grease as often as it should, or had its O-rings periodically uh, 
removed and inspected for cracks and replaced when they should have. So, yeah, I might have just gotten myself a lemon, but uh, the first one I got, which was actually a olive green version, didn't really work that properly, so I got another one, a orange version that you see in this video, which has worked perfectly for me thus far. So when you are looking for one of these lenses on the secondhand used market, really have a good look around if you're able to see that you get a copy that has been properly maintained. Because yes, these are durable cameras that are rated down to 50 meters of depth. But if they hadn't been taken care of in a proper way, you might have electronic troubles. So a little bit of a cautionary tale there, but for durability, still I give it a good rating. X-Factor, well what can I say? You're holding a camera that has been made specifically for you being used underwater by scuba divers to document the world below. You get everything from, you know, shallow coral reef dives to deep wreck dives and everything in between that can be used and photographed, documented with this camera. So for X Factor, it is brilliant, excellent all the way through. So yeah, what else can you say? Excellent. Well, current eBay prices. Well, this camera is a little bit dependent on the accessories that sell the seller are usually throwing in with this, because uh, many people seem to not wanting to sell this separately in pieces, but everything as one kit. So uh, you can get anything from about uh, 90 US dollars for uh, basically not working and for parts uh, cameras up to about. Uh, over 850 US dollars approximately and that's basically for depending on condition if it's a, if it's an original box and so on or if you're getting some accessories with it in the price so prices on eBay it's about 575 US dollars about 430 British pounds or about 504 euros for a decent kit and keep in mind that a lot of these cameras also come from Asia, preferably also then Japan, uh, which means that if you decide to buy from eBay one of these cameras, make sure that it might be a seller that has gone through the camera and done the proper maintenance, that it works properly, and uh, yeah, you might also get some customs fees and so on, and the prices here are preferably without shipping, just the price paid for the item itself. So that's a little bit of uh, what you had to look out for when buying these on eBay, in my opinion. So yeah, they're a little bit halfway between bad and good when it comes to prices. Because it's a little bit of a jungle, you need to show, see what accessories you might get with it, and if it has been properly maintained by the previous owner. But all in all, yeah, somewhere between bad and good as a rating for. As an investment, well, if you are an avid scuba diver with a interest in underwater picture taken, well, this might be a little bit of an interesting kit to have in order to enrich your, you know, your scuba diving adventures. And if you're just someone who goes around on shore taking images, well, it is a rugged camera in all weathers, so that might be a little bit of an interesting thing because it, used on land, it will keep up with harsh situations, but as a underwater camera, there are some things that you really need to learn in order to use it properly as stated previously, but as an investment, as a collector's item, well, it is in no way, shape or form, there is no doubt that this is an in, isn't an interesting part of Nikon's camera making history, uh, but also, to keep in mind that it is a maintenance heavy piece of kit as well, so I can't give it an excellent rating because of that, because you need to take care of this camera, it has parts that need regular service in order to keep it in top shape, so a little bit of a caveat there, but all in all, a really interesting piece of kit. 
kit with a lot of accessories in order to enrich your underwater photographic experience uh, if you want a challenge beyond the digital. Underwater photography is so vastly different from surface photography that I would really recommend I have a couple of different examples over here. Uh, there is a good idea to really read up or look at videos and go through a lot of different how-tos to do underwater photography to get the results you are looking for. So yet again, uh, my results for this little video might not be the best. There are the worst images that I have ever had for one of these uh, episodes, but uh, all in all, the, it is a wonderful thing to do uh, scuba diving and uh, the memories that you make doing it, I think is quite extraordinary. So all in all, if you want to do this in a good, safe, good way, First, get proper training to be a scuba di certified scuba diver. And secondly, when you do it, before you do it, read up a bunch of literature and so on to get some ideas on how to do it in a good way. And uh, yeah, that's uh, basically all that I have for you for this, in this instance. So, as always, this is Tobias Bergstrom from TB Photo X 1.5 TFX. I'd like to see you guys in the next video. And as always, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next one. So take care from now on. Bye.